The School at the Chalet, Chapter 12, Shopping and a Meeting Saturday proved to be a gloriously fine day. Joey and Grizel in their white tennis frocks looked delightfully cool, and the others in their brown gym tunics regarded them enviously. "'You look so nice and fresh,' said Margia Stevens. "'I wish I was going into Innsbruck today.' "'You needn't,' laughed Madge, at the foot of the table, where she was buttering Amy's roll for her. "'It will be stewing hot in Innsbruck today. "'Remember, there's three thousand feet above sea level here, "'and there's a delightful breeze from the lake, "'but there won't be a breath of air down in the valley. "'What it will be like by noon, I can't think.' Luckily, Gisla and Bet have enough common sense to make you keep quiet then, or I wouldn't let you go. Finished? Very well. You'd better run along, or you'll miss the train and make the others miss it, too. Have you got plenty of money? Heaps, declared Joey. Come on, Grizel, buck up. Goodbye, everybody. Expect us when you see us. With this, she danced out of the room, followed more slowly by Grizel, and soon they were hurrying along by the lake path towards Seaspitz, and the mountain railway where Gisla and Bet awaited them impatiently. While Fräulein Heffler and the Rinchini's Mamselle, or Mother's Help, as she would be called in England, was already sitting in the train. "'Come, you are very late,' cried the head girl. I had heard that we must await the next train, and Papa says that it will be so hot in Innsbruck later on. Awfully sorry, returned Joey in unruffled tones. I think our clocks must be wrong, because we thought we had oceans of time. Good morning, Fräulein Hefner. Hope we haven't gotten you spasms. Isn't it a glorious day? Fräulein Hefner, who understood about half of this speech, bowed and smiled nervously. "'Joey, have you yet learned what it is that Madame desires?' inquired Gisela, presently as the train puffed its way importantly down the mountainside. Joey shook her head vigorously. "'Not an idea. I think it's best if you get her what you think. Whatever it is, she'll like it, because it's from you. "'Hello, some people. I say, what a crowd!' "'Summer visitors,' said Bet. "'Germans, most of them.' That woman in the tartan dress comes from Berlin. I heard her say so. What a size she is, commented Grizel, as the lady in question lumbered into the car. What a tremendous way up we are. What would happen if anything broke, Gisla? said Joey. I do not think it could happen, replied Gisla seriously. I have never heard of it, but if it did, we should plunge over the side and into the path of the Sparts which lays down there. Wouldn't it be awful if the lake were suddenly to overflow? It would come down here like a mill race, wouldn't it? Joey, what horrid things you imagine, protested Grizel. Joey laughed and stopped her imagining to gaze at the lady from Berlin. She certainly was enormous, far fatter than Frau Minch. She looked uncomfortably hot, too, in a dress of scarlet, green, and yellow tartan, with a little straw hat adorned with scarlet and green bows perched on the top of her head. Her yellow hair was scraped back off her wide face, making it seem larger than ever, and she stared in front of her with eyes like gray glass. Suddenly, as if attracted by Joey's interested regard, she glared at the little girl. Englendrin, she snorted in a guttural tone. Rather, responded the irrepressible one, and proud of it, too. Joey, be quiet, said Gisela firmly. Why should I? She spoke first. It makes no matter. She is much, much older than you. Gisela had not intended her remarks to be overheard, but her voice was the clear carrying order, and the lady from Berlin not only heard but understood. The lady from Berlin called them a name. She then heaved her bulk round, nearly upsetting her opposite neighbor, an inoffensive little Troiline, who was going to market in Sparts. "'Isn't she rude?' observed Joey. "'All right, Gisa. I'm not going to say anything more. Did you say your father was going to meet us at Innsbruck?' 
Yes, Fräulein Hefner wishes to visit her parents, and Papa is going to be our escort. He will see us at the station, and will take us to the shops. Then we are going to have lunch at the Maria Theresian restaurant, and afterwards we shall go for a drive along the Brenner Road and go back by the last train. There is a gasus up the Brenner where we can have coffee, and we will take cakes with us. Do you like it? Topping, isn't it, Grizel? Rather, said Grizel, it's top hole of Herr Marini to do it. I am so glad you are pleased, said Gisela courteously. Ah, we have arrived at Sparts, and there is our train to the Innsbruck on the other side of the platform. Come, we must hurry. But it was easier to say than to do it. Frau Berlin, as Grizel had christened her, took her own time about getting out, and she blocked the doorway the girls had perforce to wait until she was well on the platform. "'Come on! We shall miss the train if we don't buck up!' shouted Joey. They nearly did miss it, too, for the mamzelle was not accustomed to dashing from one train to another, had it not been for Grizel and Gisla, who hauled her up the steps and into the carriage, with little ceremony, she would have been left on the platform. As it was, she was gasping and scared. But never mind that. We've caught the train, said Joey practically. It was full, as it was going to Vienna, Paris train, so they had to content themselves in the corridor. However, it was only for a short time, and then they reached the outskirts of the capital of Troll, where tall, flat houses faced them, with plamu hanging out of the air from the open windows, while the hot air rushed to meet them as they whirled past. "'Here we are,' exclaimed Yuzel, as the train drew up beside the busy platform. "'And there's my father. Let's go out.' There's no horrid fat Frau Berlin to stop us this time. As she spoke, she swung herself down on the platform, bumping into someone who was going heavily past. The someone turned and glared at her. Horrors! It was Frau Berlin herself. What would happen? It is hard to tell, for she had obviously heard and understood Grizel's indiscreet remark. Luckily, at that moment, Herr Marini came up and quickly grasped what had occurred. He raised his hat, apologizing courteously to the furious lady for the English child's clumsiness. Frau Berlin was not to be placid, but she rolled onward after directing a venomous glare at the impotent Grizel. "'You must be more careful, my child,' said Herr Marini, after he had assisted the others out of the carriage." and through the barrier. You might have heard that lady very much indeed. I'm sorry, murmured Grizel, untruthfully, while Gisla added, Indeed, Papa, she was very rude as we came down and called us, and she told him the name. Hush, my nimbling. I do not like to hear such words from thy lips, he said. As they crossed the station square, which lay white and hot in the brilliant sunshine, let us talk of our errands instead. We need not think of an ill-bred Berliner, but only of what is pleasant to us all. There is a shop in the museum, Strauss, where one can buy beautiful china, and said Bet, as Gisla seemed to be reduced to silence by her father's gentle rebuke. We thought we could give Madame a little coffee service. We have collected enough money for a small one. Would she like it, Joey? Or we can get her a necklace of carved ivory beads. It's topping of you, said Joey cordially. She'd rather have the china, I believe. She doesn't care too much for jewelry. The coffee service, then, by all means, agreed Herr Marini. I must go in here for two little moments to buy some cigars. Then we will go to the china shop and purchase the coffee service. How should we carry it home? asked Grizel practically, as they waited for Herr Marini outside the shop. Gisla, is there anywhere I can buy a picture of the Tarnzi? I think M, my sister, would like that best, said Joey. Yes, of course. 
There's a very good shop in the Maria Theresian Strauss, where they have pictures and photographs, too. We can go there as we go to the restaurant. Herr Marini came out of the shop at that moment, and taking Joey's hand with Bet on the other arm, said, And now we are all ready for the important part of our holiday. Let us go to the shop. He turned off as he spoke down one of the side streets that led from the Landhaus Strauss to the Museum Strauss. Now, this is the shop where the china is sold. Let us go in and choose. It was very well to say it, but it was dreadfully difficult to decide among so much. There was one coffee service with pink roses on black background and another with purple Clementis pattern all over it, and they paused a long time before one in gold and black. However, they finally agreed on the one with the blue and yellow design on a white background, and Air Marini told the woman in charge to pack it up and have it ready for them to take to the station when they should return from the Brenner Drive. Then they left the shop and turned out of the Museum Strauss into the Maria Theresian Strauss, which is a fine wide street with very good modern shops. Whether you look down or up it, you see the mountains with which Innsbruck is, ring is ringed round, and at the south end stands the Triumphal Arch and the gate, and beyond them the Horsgog Frederick Strauss, which is the crowning glory of the Golden Duck or golden roof. Grizel loved the great wide sweep of the more modern streets. Joey preferred the history steep narrowness of the Emperor Frederick's day. And there you have the difference between the two girls. Herr Marini had discovered it long since, but it amused him to see it once again in their arguments about the two most famous thoroughfares of his beloved native city. However, time was getting on, so he hushed their arguments and led them across the road to the shop on the opposite side of the street, where Joey soon succeeded in choosing a charming picture of the Tarnzi for her sister. Then they crossed once more and entered the Maria Theresian restaurant. They did not pause in the crowded room which faces on the street, but went right through to the garden room, where palms and fountains and creeper Hung trellises gave an open-air atmosphere, which was very delightful. Electric fans whirling round kept the air fresh and cool, and they all sat down with sighs of relief. It really was boiling in the streets. Then she was comfortably seated. Joey looked round and gave a little squeal. Gisla, look! There's that horrid fat woman! Gisla! who was opposite her, promptly turned round, nearly overturned her chair as she did so, and saw sitting a few yards away their late enemy of the train. She had not seen them, for she was buried in a current number of the Philigend Blatter, which is the German punch, and she looked hotter than ever. Hermani, Hermarani, who had been discussing the menu with the waiter, turned at this moment and caught the last speech of his youngest guest. Josephine, he exclaimed in horror. Joey had the grace to blush. I know it's rude of me, she murmured, but she is fat, isn't she, Herr Marini? Hush, my child, he replied. It is wrong to say such things of one so much older. Now, let us discuss our drive up the Brenner Road. I propose that we go to the outpost, where we can get coffee and rolls and butter. Perhaps we may be able to find a zither player, and then you shall hear some of our mountain songs amidst the grandest scenery on earth. Then, when we have had coffee and you have gathered your flowers, we will come down and stop at the shops for our parcels. And then we must catch the train. You like that, yes? Oh, rather, said Joey enthusiastically, jolly good of you to give us such a ripping time, Herr Marini. He laughed. I, too, like a little holiday. Here comes the soup. Joey's eyes widened at the thought of the soup on so hot a day, but when it came she discovered that it was ice cold. 
and very delicious. From her seat she could see Frau Berlin gobbling up soup also, with small regard for the good manners. However, Herr Marini kept her attention occupied, and she soon forgot the lady. Frau Berlin, on the other hand, had just seen them, and she looked furious. In her indignation, she allowed her temper to overcome her discretion, and she spat vehemently in their direction. Just as the head waiter passed between them, there was an instant uproar, for he, in the shock of the moment, stepped heavily backward, almost upsetting Gisla, whose plate of soup went flying. Herr Marini sprang to his feet, and a couple of Italians who were lunching near joined in at once, pouring forth a flood of questions and exclamations, and when the angry manager appeared on the scene, explanations of the whole affair. Several people who were sitting near stood up to see better what was happening. The author of all the disturbance snorted out something about the English people. Ten minutes later she was gone. Everyone had sat down, and the head waiter's feelings had been soothed by a gift of trinkgeld from Herr Marini, and the manager had vanished with only a very hazy idea of what had occurred, but convinced by everyone that the fault lay with Frau Berlin. I hope that this is the last time we shall see her, said Gisla. She has been horrid all round, declared Grizel, with conviction. But it was rather fun, wasn't it? Yes, it was, agreed Bet. but I like Gisla. I hope we shall see her no more. However, they were destined to meet her again, though this they could not possibly know just then. They finished their meal without further disturbance. And then Herr Marini took them back to the station square, where they got into one of the quaint old carriages which always amused the English girls so, and set off for their drive into the mountains. Chapter 13 At the Outpost Ooh, isn't this gorgeous, Joey Bettany drew a long breath as she gazed round her at the mountain which rose on every side in majestic splendor, while below the pine forest swept down to the valley, where the inn went brawling past, hurrying down to join Father Danube, Herr Marini smiled kindly down at the little girl. Her enthusiasm pleased him, for like all trollines, he loved his country devotedly. It is finer further up, he said. As we get higher and higher, we see the peaks at the other side, and if we go higher enough, we can see the Stubi Glacier. We must take you there some day. If it's fine, we're going up to the Munden Schinspitz on Madge's birthday, you know, Joey said eagerly. So, this is pleasant little climb. I want to climb the Ternjok, put in Grizel. I mean to, some day, too. Now, Grizel had said nothing about climbing the Ternjok lately, so Joey had imagined that she had forgotten about her desire to make its ascent, and she was thoroughly dismayed at Grizel's remark. I wish Herr Munch had never said anything about it, she thought. Herr Marini raised his eyebrows at Grizel's words. The turn jock, it is not a girl's climb. Best leave it alone, for the present at any rate, he said decisively. I mean to go, said Grizel, stubbornly, and I'm not a baby, Herr Marini. But will Madame permit it? put in Gisla somewhat tactlessly. It is, as Papa says, a very difficult climb. I have not done it yet. It would tire you, Grizel. Grizel made no answer, but her mouth took its old obstinate line, and Joey made haste to change the conversation. Their kindly host pointed out to them a huge white barn-like building up the mountainside. That is the outpost, he said. We shall go there in half an hour now, and then we will have our coffee. Papa, Gisla interrupted him with a cry of dismay. The cakes! We have forgotten the cakes! Now we shall only have rolls and butter. But how thoughtless Herr Marini looked! as perturbed as his daughter. Perhaps they will have 
Kuchin in the end, suggested Bet, not very hopefully. And anyway, it doesn't matter, said Joey. We can get cakes any day when we're in the town. The big Austrian's face cleared at that. That is true. You shall have cakes for Fräulein Bettany's birthday to make up for your disappointment today. My mother makes delicious honey and nut cakes, and I will ask her to make some for you. Oh, that would be ripping of you, if you will, said Joey fervently. Topping, agreed Grizel. Grandma makes wonderful cakes, said Gisla. We all love them. Madge will be bucked, murmured Madge's small sister. She is going to have a jolly birthday. It won't be a bit like English birthdays, observed Grizel, except the presents, of course, and the flowers. And the birthday cake, added Joey. She and Mademoiselle have made a huge one all right, and plummy with a threepenny and a button and a ring in it. But why, demanded Gisela, I do not understand. Don't you? Why, whoever gets the threepenny will be rich, and the ring means you will marry, and the button an old maid, explained Joey. We always did it at home, and candles round the cake, too, as many candles as you are years old. Is Miss Bettany going to have candles? inquired Grizel with interest. I don't know. She didn't say. I expect she will, though. Oh, Herr Marini, just look at those flowers. Can we get out and gather some? Best to wait till we return, he advised. Then your flowers will be fresh to take home. I say, wouldn't it be awful if Frau Berlin were there? All the others turned to Grizel, who had made this charming suggestion. Goodness, I hope not. This was said vigorously by Joey. What a wonderful idea, Grizel, said Gisela. While Herr Marini said decidedly, Oh, I should not expect it. Still, she might be, persisted Grizel. We've met her once already. Then if she should need be there, I shall trust you to say nothing. Do nothing that may upset her, said the Austrian gravely. Supposing she spits at us again, suggested Joey. She might. Then you will remember that you are English, and an English woman is not revengeful. Gisela and Bet, you must be careful of what you say. I do not wish a disturbance, which might mean that we could not have our coffee. And here we are, exclaimed Bet. We will remember. Herr Marini gave orders about the coffee to a pretty dark-eyed girl who had come out on hearing the noise of the wheels. Coffee, she said, in the low German hatios of the country. Yes, I can give you coffee very good and bread and butter too. Have you any cakes? asked Herr Marini. She shook her head. She said good-naturedly, seeing the disappointed on her girlish face. We will have that, then, decided Herr Marini. Bread and butter. She nodded. She held up five fingers of her left hand to emphasize her remark, and then ran off. I always think it's so funny to call jam marmalade, observed Grizel idly. What a pretty girl, Herr Marini. But she looks quite Italian. Look, there are some more. What heaps of children. As four or five tow-headed urchins came shyly round the corner of the house to stare wide-eyed at the visitors, all probably grandchildren of the innkeeper, and Gisela sometimes three or four families will live together in one place, like this, Papa. See? How near the mountains seem. It is only seeming so, her father said. Look, Josephine, that is the way you came to Innsbruck. There is the line over there across the river, and now our five minutes are up. Let us go and see if our coffee is ready. Bet and Grizel ran in front, bursting into the spiesal, only to draw up an amazed silence. There before them sat Frau Berlin, drinking coffee and eating bread at one of the tables. She looked up as they entered, and her, and her already purple face deepened in color as she glared at them. "'My only aunt!' gasped Grizel, 
finding her voice at last. Herr Marini was equally thunderstruck, but before anything else could be said, Frau Berlin heaved herself to her feet. "'I will mit English dogs not eat,' she announced in thunderous tones. "'Well, we don't want to eat with you either,' retorted Grizel, before Gisela could stop her. The woman glared at her in stupefied silence. Herr Marini put out a hand and dragged the children back with small ceremony. "'Be silent,' he said sternly. "'Go outside, all four of you.' However indignant he might be in some ways, Gisela knew her father insisted on obedience. So she hauled Grizel out into the open air, followed by Bet and Joey, who were half scared, half inclined to giggle. Grizel exclaimed the head girl, when they were outside. How could you speak so rudely? She has right to be annoyed now. I'm not going to be called a dog by any measly old German, retorted Grizel. Gisela threw out her hands with a little gesture of helplessness. Grizel, remarked Joey casually, you're spoiling our fun by being so silly. If you'd left it alone, She'd have been in the wrong, not us. Well, you can let that old lady call us names if you'd like, flashed Grizel, but I won't. You aren't a bit patriotic. How dare you say that, Joey was becoming heated now. I'm as patriotic as you, but I've a little more common sense. If you'd held your tongue, she would have been in the wrong, but now you've been abominably rude and let us down. Patriotic hop. If that's patriotism, I'm glad I don't possess any of it. A nice name she'll give all English girls now, thanks to you being patriotic. She stopped for sheer lack of breath, and Gisela promptly interfered. It is of no use to quarrel now. It is done, and it is a great pity, but it cannot be helped. Joey, will you come with me to gather some of those flowers? And bet perhaps you and Grizel will go the other way and see what you can find. Certainly, said Bet promptly. Come along, Grizel. Grizel's quick passion had died by this time, and she was feeling rather ashamed of herself, so she meekly followed Bet while Gisela, taking no notice of Joey's lowering expression, walked up the road, chatting easily about the flowers which grew in glorious splendor everywhere. By the time they returned, To the coffee-house, in answer to Herr Marini's call, the storm had blown over, and they were able to enjoy the excellent coffee, buttered rolls, and marmalade, which the pretty girl of the inn laid before them, on a table outside. She also produced some apples, and they made an excellent tea. Herr Marini was apparently quite undisturbed by his encounter with Frau Berlin, whom they could see in the coffee-house, thunderously drinking her coffee, with her enormous back ostentatiously turned towards them. However, Grizel was not to get off quite so lightly, for when the meal was over, they were gathering flowers to take back to the Tarnzee. Their host called gently, Another time, please, do not be so violent in your patriotism. There is no real harm done this time, but it has not made our little expedition the pleasanter. I do not think Miss Bettany would like it. No, agreed Grizel meekly. meekly. I am sorry I was so rude, Herr Marini. Well, then we will forget it, he said cheerfully. Come, I will get you some of those ferns for your bouquet, and then we must return, for we shall be too late to catch our train, and I am sure you do not want to walk up the mountain road from Sparts. Don't forget we must call for the pictures and the china, Papa, said Gisla as they were once more seated in the carriage rattling down the mountainside. The others will wish to see what we have chosen. Of course, he said. I can understand that. It's getting hotter, isn't it? remarked Joey. There was a lovely fresh breeze up by the outpost, but down here it's quite hot. That is because we are lower down, laughed Bet. Uncle, did you see Herr Rittmeister von Eckenu? Yesterday, he said that he brought Wanda and Marie six books of English school stories, all new. Wanda said she would lend them to us. Ah, that reminds me, 
said her uncle. Josephine Frau von Eckenruh has told me that she wishes to send Wanda and Marie to the chalet school. Do you think your sister will be able to have them for boarders? Joey's face flushed as she said joyfully, Oh, how glorious! I like Wanda and Marie so much, don't you, Grizel? Yes, I'm sure she can have them. Oh, what splendidious news! We are growing. We'll be a big school soon, said Grizel. There are four more girls coming next term, and with Wanda and Marie that will make us twenty-two, and there may be more yet. Are we going to live at the Tarnsey all the winter, Papa? asked Grizel. Asked Gisla. Yes, I think so, he replied. I shall spend the week with Grossmutter in town and come for the Sunday. Herr Munch is going to do the same, and Bet, I think you are to live with us. Bet clapped her hands. How delightful! Oh, Uncle Florin, I am so glad. It would have been so lonely in the Innsbruck without you all. Hasn't this been a day of happening? said Joy. Presently, as they reached the town, they retrieved their purchases and made for the station, where Herr Marini left them for a moment in order to buy a paper. As they stood in the little group waiting for him, Grizel suddenly uttered an exclamation. Oh, see, Joey, look there! Is Captain Carrick over there? Her clear accents carried high above the other noises, and the man at whom she was pointing, in defiance of good manners, heard her and turned. It was indeed Captain Carrick, raising his soft hat. He came over to them. Well, girls, fancy seeing you here. I found I had to run into Innsbruck to go to the bank. I have left Mrs. Carrick waiting for me in Munich. How is Juliet? She is not with you, I see. No, we came in to buy a birthday present for Miss Bettany, exclaimed Grizel. We are going back now. And so am I, going back to Munich. But your mention of Miss Bettany reminds me that I have a note for her from my wife. Something about her summer frocks, I think. I wonder, Miss Joey, if you would mind taking it for me. I forgot to post it, and she will get it all the sooner. Oh, rather, Joey took the note, and then the captain bade them goodbye and strolled away. Joey, you look puzzled, said Bet. What is it? Nothing, said Joey briefly. Here's Herr Marini. They accomplished the rest of the journey without any further happenings, and were, were met at Sparts by Madge and Miss Menard, Simone, Juliet, and Stevens. We thought we'd stroll round to meet you, explained Madge. What lovely flowers for me? Oh, thank you, girls. Madge, this is for you, said Joey, producing the note. It's from Captain Carrick. I saw him in Innsbruck, and he gave it to me to give to you, because he had forgotten to post it. He came in to go to the bank, and was going back to Munich tonight, he said. Madge's black brows had been drawn together in a quick frown at the sound of the forbidden Christian name, but something in Joey's tone checked her. She glanced irresolutely at the note. Read it, urged Joey. Read it now, Madge. Oh, yes, Miss Bettany, please read it, echoed Juliet, who had gone suddenly white on hearing Joey's news. Yes, read it, please. With a murmured word of excuse, Madge opened the envelope and began to read, a little puzzled frown on her face. Suddenly, she gave vent to an exclamation. Oh, how dreadful! What am I to do?